I have enabled I have enabled the, all three of the presenters to be co-hosts, so they should be able to include their PowerPoints as they speak. Our first speaker is Professor Gabriel Reynolds. Um, Gabriel's a valued colleague of mine here at Notre Dame. He's been on the theology department almost as long as me. Um, and uh, he's also my neighbor in our home at Malloy Hall. So I'm just really glad for that. I'm glad for the shared friendship we have and our work together in the department and the cooperation we've enjoyed at his initiative in organizing this conference. Um, Professor Reynolds is the Crowley Professor of Theology here at Notre Dame. And besides his main home in the World Religions World Church area, he's also in the history of Christianity, as am I. His two most recent books in an impressive publication record are Allah, God in the Quran from Yale University Press, which I think is just out this year, and the Quran and the Bible text and commentary 2018. Professor Reynolds' talk is entitled Repentance and the Path to Saintliness in the Thought of Ibn Qudamma. So I turn it over to Professor Reynolds. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. I'm really grateful for that generous introduction and really happy to see everyone. Um, it's intimidating but beautiful to see such a diverse group of scholars and friends um, really from around the world. If we went around and gave our locations, it would be uh, pretty inspiring to see how we've all come together through different cultures and religions. Um, it's a very simple talk that I'm going to give and I will just um, go ahead and share my screen now. Um, it's about a medieval figure from the 13th century whose name is, um, is Ibn Khudama, as, um, uh, as Paul mentioned. Is everyone able to, to um, see the PowerPoint okay? Okay, great. Um, Ibn Khudama is the author of a book named um, Kitab al-Tawwabin, or the Book of the Penitents. And um, he gives a certain vision for striving for saintliness through repentance. And that's what I'll speak about um, a bit in this presentation. Um, so it'll have three uh, really simple parts. I, I'd like to start with repentance in the Quran. Um, usually the Arabic word associated with, with repentance is tawbah. That word actually sort of outstrips the English word repentance, and I'll speak about that a little bit, but not say anything new, just summarize what other scholars before me um, have pointed out in that respect. Um, I think it's important to start with the Quran, just reminding ourselves that the Quran is the source of um, of uh, Islamic thought um, generally is understood to be the very the very words of God, and um, it, it is recited um, repeatedly. M many, if not most, of the classical Islamic scholars had memorized the Quran, so their brains were were marinating in the Quran, and um, it it informs their thinking um, in a profound way that we should not take for granted. Um, I really should add a second section on repentance in the Hadith because Muslim scholars also would be very familiar classically and of course still today with that second source of revelation, which are um, traditions about the words and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, but there's just not enough time, I think, to pull that off. So I'm going to move right to a second topic, which is to introduce the book um, that is at issue in this talk, which is, as I mentioned, Kitab at Tawabin. And then uh, just in a brief third part, I'd like to make the case um, that uh, there is a construction of saintliness in this book on penitent, penitence and the, penit the penitents who interest Ibn Khudama, that it is not simply a collection of tales, but there's a coherent vision to how one achieves saintliness. So we'll start then with um, the Quran. The first point I'd like to make is as I read the Quran, there is a call for um, for everyone to repent. Um, and we see some uh, examples of that in verses such as this one from Surah 66. Quran has 114 surahs. They basically go from longer to shorter surahs or chapters. So this is from chapter or surah um, 66 in which um, the Quran in an imperative um, way it commands people to seek this um, this repentance, which again is tawbah. So here we have the verb tubu from that same root, tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuhan. 
So um, turn to God in sincere repentance. And it's interesting that our translator here uses the phrase turn to render um, toba. And the reason for that is toba is used both for an action of humans who return to God and for an action of God of turning towards humans. And that's what makes it a dynamic um, word. And that's what I meant by it outstripping the English word um, for repentance. And um, th this universal call for repentance to me corresponds with a conviction that humans are generally sinful. Um, we like to focus sometimes uh, in these uh, conversations on, on saintliness, um, but the Quran has this conviction that humans are all struck, for example, in the Quran chapter 3, verse 14, with um, a love for sinful desires, hubba shahawat. Um, and there are other declarations. Here's just a few of them. The human is created weak. The human calls for evil as if calling for good, for the human is always hasty. I think the Arabic word there is ajul, behind that word hasty. Now, part of the problem, but not all of the problem, I think it's more complicated than this, is that humans have an enemy. In fact, when the Quran uses the phrase enemy, adu, um, uh, on more than 12 occasions, it's referring specifically to the animosity of the devil for humans. That's an animosity that begins with the story of the refusal of the devil to prostrate before the first human, Adam. It continues with the story in the garden in which Satan causes Adam and Eve to, um, to sin. And, uh, and then we see when um, the devil and Adam and Eve are all sent down to earth, they're sent down as enemies one to another. So humans, it's not for nothing that they're sinful and need to repent. Um, they have an enemy that um, lures them towards sinfulness. I think it's important to point out that the formula for um, repentance and righteousness in the Quran is not simply about human sinning and then turning to God. We have one really notable case here, Quran chapter 9, which is sort of the Toba or chapter of repentance. The image of the manuscript on the very first slide was from this chapter, the opening of this chapter. But here we have a case where God first turns to the sinful humans in order that they, and you see there, so that they might also turn in repentance. Taba alayhim liyatubu. So God makes the first move. I think it's really important to point that out. Um, God is not waiting to see always if humans will repent or not but God can make the first step towards humans, which itself provokes repentance from them. Um, still, repentance seems to be a necessary element of forgiveness, at least on the basis of this passage from chapter four of the Quran. God only turns, again, there's that, that word um, where God himself does tawbah in forgiveness to those who do evil and ignorance and then turn in repentance soon after. So, innama tawbatu alallahi in ignorance, only to those who do this in ignorance, and then they repent. So repentance is a necessary element to forgiveness. Um, and we'll see that that had an impact on Ibn Qudama's thinking. Um, God is not portrayed, at least in my reading of the Quran, as someone who is um, negatively affected or injured or even move to sorrow at human sin. The Quran speaks of God as ghani, which has a double meaning. On the one hand, it means something like aloof or unharmed, but on the other hand, it, um, uh, it, it is the, the opposite of the poverty of, of humans um, or the needfulness of humans. Humans are fuqara and God is ghani, meaning both rich, but also all sufficient um, or aloof. And so we have some more verses, which I won't read, which speak to the way in which God is not harmed by human sin, but nevertheless seeks their, um, the repentance of humans. I'll just wait a second in case you're trying to read these um, to give you a little bit of time. Okay. Um, again, the Quran um, desires humans to repent. The Quran even uses the, um, this strong verb of of desire. The, the translation there of Quran chapter 4 verse um, 26, this is a verse we've seen before, um, uses um, yurid, it's, it's wishes in the translation, um, but it, that can be rendered as desire. Um, God wants, almost yearns for human repentance. 
Um, okay, so we're on to part two, speaking about um, Ibn Qudama. Here we have a manuscript of his Kitab al-Tawabin um, on the right. Um, Tawab is um, a form of the noun in Arabic, which um, can, me can mean someone who simply does tawbah, someone who is um, penitent or who repents. Um, it can also be an intensive form, someone who repents repeatedly. This is the title of a book, as mentioned by a scholar named Ibn Qudam al-Maqdisi. Maqdisi, because he was originally from Palestine, Jerusalem is referred to as Beit al-Maqdis. Um, he was a Hanbali, and I'll say a couple of things about the Hanbalis. Now, in Sunni Islam, there are four principal juridical schools, the last of which, chronologically, is known as the Hanbali school. It's a school which emphasizes generally revelation over reason, although the engagement with revelation is obviously a rational process, and so we shouldn't think of them simply as fundamentalists, um, but they do privilege revelation in that relationship. So just to give an example, Hanbalis generally would favor a more literal reading of anthropomorphic language in the Quran. Um, and I, I, perhaps I'll comment a bit more on this. I think the, the Hanbali character of Ibn Khudama's thought comes through in Kitab al-Tawabin. Another element that comes through um, in Kitab al-Tawabin of his thought is um, Ibn Khudama's um, Sufi identity. This may come as a surprise to people who would think that Hanbalis are the ancestors of modern day Wahhabis or Salafis and therefore categorically opposed to Sufism. That is emphatically not the case. Hanbalis, especially the circle of Hanbalis in Syria in the 12th and 13th century to which Ibn Qudama belonged, were um, largely Sufis. Even, even Ibn Taymiyyah, um, who comes after Ibn Qudama and is the most famous Hanbali, had certain connections with the Sufi tradition. Ibn Qudama himself was a disciple of Abdul Qadir al-Jili or Jilani, and he received the cloak of the, um, of the Sufis, something mentioned by the excellent talk of Martino Diaz last week in regard to the connection with Elijah and Elisha. Um, in a biographical dictionary of the Hanbalis by someone named Ibn Rajab, um, Ibn Qudama is named a Zahid, an ascetic, and so um, he pursued a spiritual path and wasn't just an, um, an intellectual. Um, uh, Ibn Qudama um, is part of both of these traditions then, Sufism and Hanbalism, and that can coexist because both traditions have an emphasis on reliance on divine providence or tawakkul. Um, their their um, hermeneutics in reading the Quran are dif different. Uh, the Sufis are especially interest in, interested often in what they call a spiritual or esoteric reading of the text, but they both agree on um, in the spiritual life that tawakkul is the first and most important principle. And they're both, they're both skeptical of rationalist readings of Islamic revelation, something called nadar, um, both Sufis, <coughs> excuse me, and Hanbalis tend to be skeptical of that. Ibn Qudama himself is the author of a book called The Prohibition of Nadar, The Prohibition of Divine Speculation, in, um, as it plays out in the books of the theologians Ahl al-Kalam. Um, al okay, um, I want to be attentive to time. Um, Paul, I think I have about eight minutes. Does that sound right to you? Yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to check in. All right, thank you. So um, the Kitab uh, al-Tawabin in the introduction, Ibn Khudama himself says, this is a book in which I mention certain stories of the penitents. Why? In order to inspire longing for their stories and desire for their states and for the imitation of them. So this is a book that's not a distant, dry, academic consideration or retelling of certain stories but is meant for the spiritual reformation of the reader. Um, the basic message, I argue, and this is um, not always um, the clear teaching of Islamic tradition. According to Ibn Qudama, Tawbah, again, that's the Arabic term that generally corresponds with repentance, is not simply regret. And as we'll see, there are traditions which uh, equate it with regret, but it is rather a return from wrongdoing or disobedience to God to a proper state of submission to God and his law. Now we can detect in some of the stories in 
um, this book that for non-Muslims, Tawbah principally means conversion to Islam. So there's a wonderful story he tells of um, a Persian mystic named Ibrahim al-Khawas, who um, goes on the Hajj, that is the pilgrimage to Mecca, and along the way he runs into a Christian who has a suspicious name of Abdul Masih, or servant of Christ, and the mystic is attracted to this group of, um, of pilgrims and travels with them, and right when they get to the boundary of the sacred um, area around Mecca, the Muslims tell Abd al-Masih, they tell him, listen, um, friend, you can't go any further with us. Only Muslims can go into Mecca. And so he sort of disappears and one gets the idea that he sort of hid behind a rock because several days later in Mecca, they find him there at the Kaaba and they're like, uh, what are you doing here? And um, he says, well, as soon as I saw the Kaaba, um, I repented and embraced Islam. And then there's this nice phrase. He says, As for today, I am the servant of the one whom the Christ himself is a servant, or of whom Christ is a, is a servant. Um, so it's a play on his name, Abd al-Masih. He's now Abd Allah, basically, or Abdullah. There are other um, stories which um, make the point that repentance is not simply regret. Here is a prophetic tradition, as I alluded to above, that does equate repentance with um, regret. But other traditions, for example, in the lexicographical work of Araq al um, he says Tawbah is forsaking or leaving, tarqadhan, forsaking or leaving sin completely. So I hope that makes sense. There are these two competing um, streams of thought in regard to what Tawbah consists of. I think I have about five minutes here. Um, I just want to make the point briefly, I think there are two slides about this, that Ibn Qudama does see repentance as a universal desideratum. Everyone needs to repent, including the prophets. This may sound controversial for those who have heard of the doctrine, doctrine of Esma, according to which the prophets are all inimitable or at least impeccable, they didn't um, sin. Um, but in generally in the Hanbali school, the notion of Esma did not mean that prophets were completely free of sin, um, but rather that they repented immediately, they were aware of their sinfulness. And in fact, there's a whole section of Kitab at on the repentance of prophets. That repentance means that a prophet is able to be exemplary for other Muslims. If a prophet didn't repent, then um, he would never be able to demonstrate repentance and be uh, an exemplar for other Muslims. So Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, says, those who believe and then believe and those who sin and then repent are superior to those who have always believed or never sinned. And sure enough, he tells stories, I won't read these because time is short, but he tells the story of the repentance of Adam after his sin in the garden by disobeying God. Um, Adam cries so much that plants sprout, uh, sprout up all about him. Um, Ibn Qudama tells a story related to the incident, unfortunate incident of David and Bathsheba, one that has its roots in the Talmud, in um, the Babylonian Talmud, in the tractate, tractate of, this, of Sanhedrin, in which um, David shot an arrow at a beehive and that revealed Bathsheba bathing behind the space that had been previously blocked by the beehive. Um, it all unfolds a bit like the, um, the anecdote in the Bible, according to which David realizes his sin. And once again, in Ibn Qudama's account, he cries so much that grass grows from the tears which have watered the ground. And he quotes this really beautiful um, uh, declaration of repentance by David. Praise be to the creator of light, the one who divides hearts. Praise be to the creator of light. Oh my God, you have left me before my enemy, the devil, and I could not stand up to his temptation when it came upon me. Praise be to the creator of light. I thought that was really beautiful when I read it. Okay, finally, I'd just like to make the point in about the two or three minutes I have left that in a number of accounts dealing with companions of the prophet, Ibn, uh, Ibn Khudama makes it clear that it's not enough simply to regret one's sin, one must do something. To, so he tells a story for example of someone named Ibn Lubaba who sinned by not going on a raid with the prophet to Tabuk and he chains himself to a column in the prophet's mosque and at the end he gives his goods away as sadaqa, as a, a generous charitable giving or gift. Um, 
Abu Huraira um, features in another story where a woman comes and confesses fornication to him. And in the end, the woman repents. And notably, you might have heard of traditions in Islamic law where women are stoned for fornication. In this story, um, the woman is forgiven on the basis of Quran 25, 68 to 70. But in her repentance, she um, also gives a garden which she gives as sadaqa, as a charitable gift. Um, now, these notions of doing something or giving a gift are um, something like propitiatory or expiatory acts. The Quran, in fact, for certain sins, does speak about kafara, maybe coming from um, Hebrew kapara, like Yom Kippur, which is upon us in just a few days. Um, and so there are Quranic roots to this notion of doing something. Quran also speaks about fidya, a ransom or redemption, such as feeding a poor person. This is really the last thought. This is basically the last slide, if you're willing to bear with me just a little bit longer. Um, so there's something Sufi about this, and this is basically my con concluding argument. In the Sufi or mystical way of Islam, it's not enough simply to feel regret for sin. One struggles against sin. One struggles against the sinful or lower self, what is known as the nafs in Islamic tradition. Um, and uh, Ibn Qudama's own Sufi master, Al-Jili, thought of the life of the Sufi as a campaign against the association or idolatry which is within each person, the idolatry of the self. A Sufi exegete by the name of Sahel al-Tustari, who was a couple of centuries earlier than Ibn Qudama, um, speaks about the need for repentance. He says, it is obligatory at every moment and instant, and there's no punishment more severe on them than the lack of knowledge of repentance. Um, he continues, Sahel says, what is repentance? it is not to forget your sin. So just as a, as a concluding thought, for Ibn Khudama, what distinguishes the righteous or the saints from the unrighteous is not sinlessness, but this striving um, that we saw in the Sufi tradition, the greater jihad, if you know that tradition. It is a commitment to repentance at every moment and instant. And in this respect, the Kitab at Tawabin of Ibn Khudama is a thoroughly Sufi work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. Um, we now welcome questions from anyone. Um, if you do put up your hand, it's easy for me to recognize you. Otherwise, glad to just have you call out. Uh, Brad. This is a wonderful talk, Gabriel. I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. I have two questions for you. First of all, this book that you're talking about, is it an English translation? That's the first question. I don't think it's ever been translated, I, I, in, into, as far as I know, into any European language. Okay. And the second thing is, how is it found elsewhere outside of this book that the prophets of the Quran, they, that they undergo repentance? Is it only here or do you find that elsewhere in the tradition of Islam? Um, it is it's widespread. Um, and there are accounts in the Quran which seem to point clearly to prophets repenting. Um, God turns to Adam after his sin. Um, Moses, after asking to see God, he clearly um, expresses um, repentance. Um, that account that believes in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter, but in others as well. And so what happens is in exegetical literature, in the, the commentary tradition, there are um, debates over um, what does it mean that a prophet could sin and repent? And um, some, uh, some exegetes for certain cases would say, well, a, a prophet might sin before his mission, so before he begins his prophetic mission, or a prophet might have certain slips or failings or errors, but nothing that amounts to them, which would be a technical term for sin. Um, and then the other thing I would add to that is in the particular juridical tradition of Ibn Qudama, the Hanbalis, which is most famously represented by two other scholars that come a bit later that century. One is Ibn Taymiyyah, who dies in 1273, I think, but that's on the top of my head. And then the other is his student, Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya. Um, they're both very clear that, that prophets can sin. Um, and they, this probably stems from a more um, literal reading of the Quran in which they look at those anecdotes of the prophets um, and they're reticent to explain them away 
with some of the strategies that other commentators use. Thank you so much. Other questions? Rob? We can't hear you. In certain traditions of Christian theology, a distinction is variously drawn between justification and sanctification. And I wonder if there's any such distinction in Islam. Were you able to hear me? Yeah, I could hear you perfectly. I'm just trying to come up with a good answer in my head. <laughs> well, I think I, I think others could answer that better than than I, and I'd really welcome if anyone wants to add a thought. I, I, I would say that, um, you know, the notion, and we're going to have a talk from um, um, Professor Tabara in just a moment about walaya. The notion of walaya in Arabic usually is thought to correspond with saintliness. And in Sufi tradition, um, it, um, it, one could be um, justified in the sense of um, living in obedience to Sharia, to law, but um, not well advanced on the path of walaya. Um, and the awliya or the saints um, are those who have done something more than follow the law, but entered into a deep friendship with God. D does that sound basically right, Naila, or anyone else? Okay. We're getting affirmation from Nyla. Okay. Any other questions? Probably have room, sound for one or time for one or two more. Uh, Laila, Laili, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor. It was um, a really great uh, presentation. Um, and I just want if you can explain further about that idea of um, Tauba as a concept of God being close, like walking, walking closely to human, um, and also its connection with um, this um, verse in the Quran that says that God is closer to us than our own jugular vein. Like, is there like any like um, contextualization between them? Is it like should we read it as um, so when we are sinning, it means that we actually make God walk further from us, and hence tauba means also we walking back to God and God walking back to us. Like, how do you uh, relate those two um, concepts? Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a great question, um, Leili. Thank you so much. Um, first, in regard to the, there's a famous verse. I think it's in um, Surah 50, which may be Surah Qaf, which um, says. Um, we created the human and we know what his, um, or the human's nafs, meaning innermost part, um, whispers to him or her, and goes on to say, and we are closer to the person than the jugular vein. Um, I, I think in, in, con in this Quranic context, it suggests that um, human, God is observing humans in relation to his judgment. But it, um, in fact, in the, in the theological tradition, it's become a very important verse for um, exactly what you're saying, Lili, um, reflection on the nearness or closeness of, of God. Um, and, you know, it's important to remember that the theological enterprise is not just about reading a verse. Um, but involves um, a, a spiritual reading of the verse. And so those readings are, are legitimate. Um, I, I do think that the theme of closeness in, um, in, in distance um, is um, interesting in the Quran. I, I would be reticent to use or hesitant to use the term um, of divine farness. I just, that's sort of instinctually, I, I think of the way that God speaks to everyone even, even the damned in hell, um, even the sinners. I mean, the Quran has direct divine addresses to everyone, which I think probably redounds to a belief that God is, God is close in a sense. But there may be passages about nearness and farness I'm missing. So I, I probably have more to learn about that. Thank you very much, Professor Reynolds. Um, our next speaker is Professor Naila Tabada from uh, Lebanon. Um, she is a co-founder of the Adyan Foundation in Beirut um, and director in the Institute of Citizenship and Diversity Management at Adyan. 
she has a PhD in the science of religions from the Ecole Pratique des Etudes des Etudes à Paris. Um, and uh, we're really glad she's agreed to give a paper and we look forward to her talk, which is entitled, as Gabriel made reference to, Walaya between its ontological and its existential understanding. Professor Tabara, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, thank you very much. Very happy to be with you. And sorry, excuse me, I'm a bit like exhausted, but I hope I'll just get uh, um, more excited with my talk as I as I move along. Uh, with the, with the Zoom, I had two inter other international conferences today, so yeah. But, but it's interesting. I've been to Rome, New York, and now Indiana. So uh, this is my PowerPoint, just sharing my screen. OK. So uh, I'll explain a bit, uh, in a bit, what I mean by the title. Um, OK. So just to go back to uh, pure etymology, um, in, in Islam, we talk about awliya, wali, which is the plural of wali. And wali, or saint, it, it is closeness to God or friendship with God. Uh, the awliya, or uh, the, the singular form, wali. And it comes from the same root, walaya, which, is, which gives Wilaya and walaya with a with a kasra or a fatha. When it's wilaya, it is more the sense of uh, being responsible over. So this is given to governors. Al wali and wilaya is 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 in that sense. And walaya means the proximity of God or the friendship with God. Now the same term is one of the names of God. So Allah Luali, and in that sense, God is at the same time the protector, the responsible, and the close. But when we're talking about the the the, the Wali in the sense of, of sainthood, means it means the friends of God, and according um, to 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 a hadith or to a saying of of many Sufis that uh, the Wali is he whose sight reminds of God. So when we see them, when we see a wali or a waliya, we are reminded of God. So they are close to God, but also, as we will see in a bit, they are the ones who, um, through whom God acts. So they are receptacles, they are uh, uh, of, of, uh, of divine action. So, and they are also the locus of uh, divine graces. A lot of the classical description of the awliya is through their karamat. Karamat is the uh, term that is given instead of mu'jiza. So it's, uh, it's, it's miracles that non-prophets do. So mu'jiza is miracles that prophets do. Karamat are divine graces that are given to non-prophets. In the Quran itself, the first examples uh, of, uh, of walaya and of, of those karamat, of those divine graces, are first Mary and then the sleepers of the cave. Mary, because according to the Islamic, uh, to the Quranic text, was, she was in the sanctuary. And when Zachary used to go into the sanctuary, he used to find there what the Quran calls risk, which is goods, and what our commentators say that it's either the fruits of heaven or the fruits of summer and winter or the fruits of winter and summer. So this is an indication of something outside of the norm that is happening, that there is a miracle here. So it's a karama and it's given to Mary who is according to many the uh, the prototype of the uh, of the sufi and of the wali or, or the waliya yeah. uh, the second example is the sleepers of the cave again also it is a christian story of the young young people uh, they appear in surah 18 so uh, the chapter 18 of the quran 
and those young people believed in God or and in at a time of polytheism. So they ran to hide to to hide in a cave because the 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 emperor at their time gave them an ultimatum that they should like renounce their faith. So they ran into uh, to to like to gain some time actually in a cave, and this is where God made them sleep for 309 years and was returning them during their sleep. Also, this is a miracle that they slept for 309 years. So in both cases, they are receiving uh, divine graces from God, Mary or the sleepers. And this is the sign of their wilaya. Uh, but later, we will see in, uh, in, in Sufism that um, divine graces don't need to be external. They can be internal. Divine graces could be uh, divine assistance to someone, God helping them throughout their life. And it could be also uh, inner meanings, esoteric meanings of the Quran, understanding those. So they don't need to be always external. Okay. So what is my title and what do I mean by it? My question is, what makes a wali a wali? Is it a divine pre-election or is it the effort done by the wali himself or herself? And this is why I talk about two perceptions. One of them is the ontological and second is the existential. By ontological, I mean the idea that the wali is by nature different than other people so ontologically different because he or she was selected by God or elected by God from pre-eternity. And this is a motif that we will find among the Sufis. Another motif is another perception, which I call the existential one, is that a wali becomes a wali through an itinerary, through an effort, starting with what Gabriel mentioned, starting with repentance, which is the first step on that path, and then continuing through a spiritual itinerary uh, uh, where they work on, on themselves, where they um, work on emptying basically themselves from their own attributes, from any uh, 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 attachments, uh, and to give themselves completely to God and to receive God and thus become instruments of God who would act through them as per this Hadith Qudsi that uh, the servant um, um, gets closer or tries to get closer to God through um, surrogatory acts like acts not only the obligatory pr prayers until God loves him. And when I love him, this is God saying, I'm his hearing, his sight, his tongue, his heart, his hand, sorry. Uh, I need to just go back. Okay, his heart, uh, his hand and his foot. By me he hears, by me he sees, by me he speaks, and by me he moves. So this is the person who reaches that walaya becoming so close to God and so emptied of themselves that God acts through, the, through them and that they hear through God and see through God. So both perceptions have coexisted in, in the Sufi tradition throughout the centuries. Uh, and sometimes we see the same Sufi uh, author uh, talk, uh, talking about both. Uh, I mean, mentioning both the existential and the ontological. So talking about pre-election, but also talking about the itinerary. What we feel or we see that the ontological perception gained more uh, uh, popularity with time. Uh, and, and I will say, uh, I will say why. Although in this presentation, I will try to argue that the existential understanding of Walaya is closer to the uh, Quranic meaning. Uh, 
and, and carries a deeper humane meaning than uh, election. So I will start with the um, sorry. So I will start with the ontological uh, perception. So I think this is my understanding. I, why did they think about election? Because Sufis try to return everything to God. So to say that everything is actually God's doing. Um, even when Sufis themselves become closer to God, and even when they tread the path. Many of them say that in the end, I, I learned that it was him who made me walk. And as we saw with Gabriel earlier, uh, God repented on them so that they repented. So everything starts with God, basically. So that is, I think, the idea behind saying that there is a divine uh, election. But it's also related to some discussions that were happening in the uh, theological or ilm uh, al-kalam spheres about qadar and about how much do, do we have agency and how much are things uh, uh, from God. So that, I think this is behind the idea of attributing sainthood to God instead of attributing it to the person. So saying that it is pre-elected, so we're attributing the sainthood to God. Yet, what is very weird is that we start seeing among the Sufis that they don't only attribute divine uh, pre-election, uh, I mean, to God, but also they attribute rejection to God in the sense that some people are pre-elected as to become saints, basically, or to become awliya, and others are also pre-selected to become rejected become people that are away from God's grace. Uh, in the, one of the Sufi uh, commentaries, the Ta'wilat al-Najmiyya, which is by two people called Najmuddin, Najmuddin Kubra and Najmuddin Daya, in their commentary of the verse uh, 99 of Surat al-Kahf, the cave, that describes judgment, they, they say, God, as per the laws of his pre-eternal wisdom and will, has preser preserved those he preserved from amongst humans from these negative attributes, exchanging them through the elixir of the law with angelic qualities and divine attributes, whereas he has abandoned those he abandoned by letting their negative attributes appear. So pre-election and pre-abandonment. Yet one could argue that this actually beats the purpose of Judgment Day and contradicts the idea of God's justice. If he pre-elected people to be some of them completely abandoned or away from God's grace and other to be saints, this, this beats the purpose of judgment. Uh, and also, I think that the idea of pre-election, if it was first conceived to uh, give sainthood to God and not to uh, to attribute it to people, actually with time it became the, com the contrary. Because the wali perceived as ontologically different, as pre-elected by God and ontologically different than other human beings, start being seen as a meta-human. So he starts being seen as an intercessor that we need to venerate and uh, that has special powers including the queen including the power of saying kun fakana and this we find it in the uh, kun fakana fiat let it be so be it be it uh, so 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 a creator power they start having that power in the eyes of of people so they're not a model that people can relate to but a figure an ideal that people venerate and so they as, as an ontological example, as an ontological uh, perception of walaya, that perception uh, uh, moves away the wali from regular uh, humans. And I think that this doesn't go hand in hand with the Quranic text, because the Quranic text presents that all humans are on ontologically equal. And with the, between Quranic text and the Hadith, we understand that all humans are ontologically equal, yet what makes, uh, what separates or distinguishes a human from the other is their level of taqwa, 
that we used to translate as piety, but recently we're translating it as God consciousness. So, so the idea of the, the pre-election and the ontological uh, uh, understanding of walaya, I think, is actually weak and is not connected really to the, uh, to the Quranic uh, um, perception. So I'm going to move to the existential perception of walaya. In this existential perception, the wali is like any other human. It's a, he or she is a person like others, but it's a person that had the courage to undergo the, uh, the, the, the spiritual path. As somebody who uh, has worked on, sorry, there's a, there's a typo here, on him, uh, himself or herself and showed courage, perseverance and transparency on the spiritual path. path. These persons that work on themselves, as, as mentioned before, starting with uh, repentance and then start working on maqamat and then on receiving ahwal, they, and they overcome their lower selves and start becoming the best versions of, of themselves through a path of self-realization and thus transforming themselves and allowing themselves to be transformed by God. I think that this perception rehabilitates the role of the wali in her wilaya, in his or her wilaya, because it shows that it is their choice, their work, and they have the agency. Um, one thing to take into consideration is that in Sufi literature, when somebody, and now, for example, we were talking about the tawabun, the repentance, we do have both. We have the examples of those who themselves decide to repent, and we have those who actually were completely uh, on, like uh, oblivious of God and... Uh, but then something happens to them, it's God that makes them repent. Yet in both cases, they undergo the, uh, uh, the itinerary. So even if the first call is a call from God, not from themselves, then they have to say yes to this call. And here again, there's the agency. And they go through the path of uh, self-realization. Um, and this perception is more in accordance with the Quranic message that says that God is the wali of those who believe. So God is, is the wali and they are the, the, the awliya. It is open. It's open for, uh, for all. And here, just to note that Ibn Arabi considers that those who believe here is not only Muslims, not only monotheists, but everyone who, that believes. So this type of walaya, this perception of walaya is open to all. So this reminds me of a saying by Rabi al Adawiya. Uh, a man called Salih, Salih al Mirri came to her and said that um, the door will open to who, who to, to he who knocks a lot. And Rabi responds, the door is open. The question is who wants to enter it. So um, I understand that she's talking about that path. Sahl al-Tustari, mentioned also by Gabriel, uh, commenting the verse uh, in, in Surah Yunus that says about the awliya, that the friends of God shall have no fear, nor shall they grieve, says the awliya are those whose sight reminds of God, as mentioned, and whose actions are in constant progression towards inner harmony. So giving also that example of, um, of walaya as 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 the fruit of a personal itinerary of people working on uh, having an inner harmony. How much time do I have left to see if I can tell a story or not? Maybe two or three minutes. Oh, okay. I can't say the story. I'll keep it for the questions if you want a nice story. Great. Okay. Um, so describing the path that leads to Alaya, the Sufi Ruzbahan Bakli Shirazi, who also has a, has a, a commentary, but here it's not in his commentary, uh, uh, in another book, he says, the beginning of the path is the will. So we start with repentance, with the will to take the path. And it is accompanied by spiritual combat. The middle of the path is love, and it is accompanied by miraculous graces, the karamat that we talked about. The end of the path is gnosis, uh, arfan. 
knowledge. And it is accompanied by contemplation of God in everything. When the self is firmly settled in these degrees and when it is beyond Talween, Talween are the changes that occur during, uh, during the path when, upon the reception of spiritual states that come from God. So it changes the person until they become uh, stronger. And uh, we talk about Tamkeen when we are beyond Talween. So when it is beyond ta ta uh, uh, Talween, when it swims, the self in the ocean of oneness and the secret of singularity. He, she is then a wali, a substitute of prophets and a sincere one among the pure ones. So in the path towards Wilaya, Wilaya, sorry, the wali, the wali to be allows God to be their wali. And here in the three senses, the sense of protector, God is their protector, God is their friend, and God is the one in charge of them, of their life. As Mary, God was in charge of her life and uh, when she was in the sanctuary and the, the sleepers of the cave. Also, like Mary in the Quran, we see the mother of Mary saying that, uh, I give to God what is in my stomach completely liberated. Uh, from everything so she is liberated she is the example of the Sufis she is ex the example of the awliya because she's liberated from everything so uh, um, so to be used by God and turned by God as he turns the sleepers of the cave from uh, left to right while they are in their 309 years of, uh, of sleep so the liberation is not only a liberation from lower attractions of this world, attachments, passions. It is a liberation from higher things of this world, like knowledge or a good reputation. Mary also, in the Quran, she is liberated. She faces with a very calm soul all the indignations and accusations of her people of being a dissolute woman. They tell her, how did you get that child? So. She, 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 she gives us an example that a, a, a wali or a waliya is ready to uh, have their reputation questioned also. It's not to be known as, wow, the best person, this, is, this person is a saint. So when w people become saints when they give up actually wanting to be seen as saints, basically. That's the idea. And it's also a liberation of expectations of the other world. And this is how we understand the famous uh, uh, saying of Rabi'ah that I don't worship God out of fear of hell nor out of love for paradise. But uh, so not for any, is not expecting anything in the other world. So just to make it uh, uh, faster, I'm, I'm, I'm arriving at my conclusion. So uh, with this liberation, uh, the awliya, they free themselves to receive God and to become thus his sight and his hearing and thus be reminders of God. And what happens here is when, because when they give themselves to God and freely liberated of everything, God returns them to people. The, the deserving and the undeserving. The Noon, also a famous uh, Sufi from Egypt, says, the believer is like earth. It carries everything on it. He is like the cloud. When it comes, it covers everything. He is like rain. When it falls, it waters everything, whether he likes it or not. So basically, this, the saint or the wali, when it's given to the people, back to the people, it's given to everyone. As a, so this is my conclusion. With the walaya as the path, a spiritual itinerary open to all. Not only are we closer to the Quranic message, but we are rehabilitating humans. What happens at the end of the itinerary when the person reaches the station of Walaya, be they aware of it or not, is a dual testimony. On the one hand, the Wali testifies of God to humans because they're emptied of themselves, of their ego and the coloration uh, to allow a God to act through them. So they testify of God to humans, uh, and thus they remind of God. On the other hand, the wali testifies to God that humans are worth being vicegerents on earth, Khalifa, and are worth the favor that he has favored them 
uh, all before existence. Because according to the Quran, if there is pre-election, it's for all humans through the favor of karama and khilafa. So the wilaya, uh, wilaya, according to an existential understanding, allows us to see the awliya as models like us, as living examples that with love, courage, and endurance, we can reach a higher measure of being human. Thank you. Thanks so much, Professor Kabara, especially in the midst of your fatigue, your third Zoom conference today. Maybe you could re uh, stop sharing your screen so we could see all the faces. Thank you. Um, so we welcome some questions. Congratulations. Thank you. So we welcome some questions. Uh, Professor Stinton. Yes, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your paper very much. So just a point of clarification then in your analysis. Um, are you saying then that with the person of Mary, would you, would the Quran or would Sufism um, interpret her then more um, on the ontological, from the ontological perspective? Or are you saying more from the existential perspective? Or just help me understand, because I know within Christian tradition, there are various interpretations of Mary along these lines. So if you could just clarify for me what your central argument is about Mary and your analysis of her. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. Now, I would say that m my uh, understanding, I would go for the existential. We have uh, about Mary that God has elected her, that God has uh, favored her among all the women. Uh, uh, but it can be understood that it is due to what she is, not that this is pre-eternal. It could be. But we also have a verse that speaks that Mary and her son have been preserved from Satan. So there is something special about Mary. But what the, the example of Mary for Sufis is incredible. But if we start her story with her mom, with, with Anne, uh, saying that what is in her uh, uh, womb is is liberated to God only. So for for Sufis uh, and especially uh, there's a beautiful interpretation by Sultan Walad, the son of Jalal al-Din al-Rumi. Uh, this Mary is the example for the Sufi. The Sufi has to go exactly the way she lived according to the Quran. So starting with purely uh, uh, completely giving oneself to God and liberating ourselves from everything to be given to God, allowing ourselves to be in God's sanctuary and to grow between God's, uh, under God's eye, basically. And, and uh, the Quran um, uh, describes Mary growing up like a, a plant. And betahana betah and hasan, growing up like a, a plant under the uh, God's providence and God's care, and then moving away to receive from God, and then receive. I mean, having that strength to uh, to 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 receive from God, but also that strength to go under a lot of pain, which is the pain of birth. And that this is from the pain of birth that the insan al camel that the uh, ultimate, uh, uh, like higher self uh, uh, or, or uh, the perfect uh, human uh, comes out of her. And the same way the soul of the Sufi has to go through pain so that the, 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 uh, the uh, even Rumi also says that Jesus of oneself is born, the highest person, the highest form of us can be born. So it's it's a it's a beautiful motif. I think it is beyond what I was saying of, of existential and ontological. It is such a strong image of uh, of, of itinerary um, that, but. I also think that sometimes what we do to uh, figures uh, is that we sometimes lose 
their, uh, their they, because they mean so much to us, we forget that human examples and what they mean to us as a humans who overcame everything that they had to overcome. And for me, Mary is stronger if she's seen as a human and yeah. whatever what she lived uh, through. Yeah, that's Whether beautiful. Whether uh, Islamically or Christian, I mean, the, the Christian story. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I cannot Tamara. agree. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Any quick questions? We're a little bit behind time. I want don't want I want to make sure that Professor Takawi has sufficient time. Any quick questions before we turn to him? I, just quick question. Uh, yes, Munim. Thank you for the wonderful talk. So, what about um, verses in the Quran that seem to suggest that everything has been decided by God, that God not only you know guide who who He wish, but also also you know led astray to whom He He wish. I mean, how, how do you interpret that? Beginning, did you say what about the verses that say that? Yeah, you did Allah my yahdi my yasha, or you did Allah my yasha, right? Yeah, because one other uh, one other explanation of this is man yasha. If I if not the the men is not referring to God, but it is in in referring to the people who want to be guided and the people who don't want to be guided. So God guides those who want to be guided and doesn't guide those who does not do not want to be guided. Thank you very much, Professor Tabara. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we now turn to the last prof uh, paper of the day. Professor Murad Takawi will be giving it. Um, Professor Takawi is a recent graduate of our World Religions World Church PhD program. I think your degree came in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, Murad. And Professor Takawi began teaching as an assistant professor at the University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, Texas. Um, Murad was a wonderful student here for a number of years for his MTS and his PhD, and we're very proud of him in his new environment, and we trust he's making a wonderful impression among um, the, the students and faculty and staff in San Antonio. So, Professor Takawi's talk is entitled, Blood, Ink, and Tears, Remembering the Lives of Proto-Sunni Ascetics. Thank you so much for the warm welcome and uh, generous introduction. I'm honored and thrilled to be here and great to see uh, so many of you. Uh, and again, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to present. So let me start by sharing my screen. Can you see it now? Can you see? Okay. Do you want to try to send it to me as an email? Yes, I'll do that. I'll do that in a moment. Thank you. Okay. Murad, what is it telling you when you hit share screen? Because you are listed as a co-host, so I don't know why that wouldn't happen. You need to unmute if you want to say something. Hey, Murad, can you hear me okay? You want to try Ooh, now, perhaps? Yeah. Try, yeah, try again, um, Murad. Yeah. Try yeah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll just send it. Yeah. Try that, tr but try to share now as well. Okay. Sorry. So I sent it and then I'll try to share now again. You sent it to me? Yes, and to Gabriel. Okay. So, 
So now I'm even more, like, more looking forward to my presentation at AR if this is, you know, if this is what's going on. What is it telling you when you hit share screen, Muro? Uh, it, it, it doesn't let me try to, you know. It looks to me like you did, I, I made you, okay, now oh, you. There we go. Now oh, we so can, now you can see it? Well, we see yes. something now, yes. Yes, we got you it. See the, okay, good. The beginning yet. So let me do this. Do you see the presentation? We see. Yes, you're not in presentation. There you go. Okay. Yep. Good. So, uh, so the title of my paper is Blood, Ink, and Tears. Towards the end of the presentation, if you have a liquid analogy for money, that will help me as well to add it to the list of the liquid things here that are at play. So blood, ink, and tears, we might add liquid money. And this is a, a paper about remembering how the early Muslims uh, remembered even earlier Muslims. So this is set before uh, the, we have Sufis or even we have Sunnis. So this is remembering the lives of proto-Sunnis and also proto-Sufis. So my paper is focusing on one figure and I invite you to explore how the later authors remembered this figure who's from the second century of Hijra or, or of the Islamic calendar or the eighth century of the common era, an ascetic and a holy warrior and trans transmitter of prophetic traditions. And indeed the larger the life figure of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak. So in many ways, ibn al-Mubarak is remembered as an exemplary figure. Uh, he's celebrated among later Sunnis and Sufis as a religious leader earning him the title of Imam, or one of the four Imams uh, transmitting the Hadith, uh, ascetic, a holy warrior, and a prominent transmitter and collector of prophetic traditions, earning even the title of commander of believers, or of the faithful in, trans in the transmission of prophetic traditions. So Amir al-Mu'minin fil Hadith. Uh, in the following, I will investigate the life of Ibn al-Mubarak as presented in later traditionist and Sufi biographical literature. And I will focus on three interrelated practices held by, and in many instances shared with, other proto at his time. So I take him as an exemplary of this movement, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an exemplary uh, saint and figure representative of this movement, or of this time period. Uh, I will focus on the collection and transmission of prophetic traditions, hadith, holy war, uh, jihad, and of course, asceticism, all of which are main aspects of proto-Sunni orthopraxy. So I'll start with a brief note on, on, on his background. He was born in uh, 118 of, of, uh, of Hijra or 736. I'll just, I'll just use the common era dates. Uh, they tend to be more familiar to everyone, to a Turkic father and a Khorasmian mother. Uh, and he died in what is now today's Iraq in the year uh, 797, some 13 years after having retired from jihad. The biographical accounts paint a vivid picture of his piety and moral exemplarity. Ibn al-Mubarak is described as a companion of the Quran, Alif al-Quran, as a companion of pilgrimage, and as a companion of the jihad, and has even earned high-flown titles such as the most knowledgeable of the East and West, Alam Ahl al-Masriq wal Maghrib, and even King of Kings, Shah and Shah, of course, the title given to the Persian king, well, uh, the earlier Persian kings. So the extant sources know, uh, tell us very little about Ibn al-Mubarak's family and childhood. However, we get a sense that he had an affluent upbringing. And indeed, Ibn al-Mubarak appears to have used his resources to fund his career as a holy warrior on the Byzantine frontier, as well as to fund his travels collecting prophetic traditions. Perhaps even embarrassed by such wealthy background for a prominent ascetic figure, some later accounts emphasize Ibn al-Mubarak's supposed humble origins. So one biographer, for instance, cites a fanciful tradition uh, on the virtuous pedigree of Ibn al-Mubarak's uh, father, uh, or Ibn al-Mubarak himself. And according to the story of his, Ibn al-Mubarak's father, 
who is presented here as a servant or a slave, failed to honor his master's request to get him a good pomegranate from, from the garden. Of course, on account of him not having tasted pomegranates before, which is a testimony of his virtue. And as a reward, so the story goes, his master offered him his daughter in marriage. The story, however, seems to have been initially attributed to another ascetic and contemporary of Ibn al-Mubarak, uh, Ibrahim ibn Adham, and indeed contradicts many other reports. In fact, other sporadic references to Ibn al-Mubarak's parents seem to suggest a different picture. For instance, one tradition notes that young Ibn al-Mubarak spent the 50,000 dirhams, so that's, that's a lot of dirhams, that his father gave him to trade with in his quests for religious knowledge. Uh, so his father gave him all this sum to, to use it in trade, and instead he used it to collect prophetic reports or prophetic hadith. And reporting later to his father, he confronted him saying, quote, this is my trade. And of course, his father gave him another 30,000 dirhams to help him with his real trade, which is collecting prophetic hadith. Ibn al-Mubarak is reported to have inherited the land of his father, as well as, this is another report, 100,000 dirhams. Uh, enough capital for him to spend over uh, for 450,000 dirhams, as reported in another tradition. And all of these, of course, are silver dirhams. That's a lot of money, as reported in another tradition, in his quest for religious knowledge and good deeds, and even leave 90,000 dirhams after his death. So we have a sense in which this might have been embarrassing to later, to later, uh, to later accounts. And we'll see how actually this is quite the opposite of that, that he, he, he provides an exemplary figure of someone who's using money to, uh, to, be, to, be, to gain independence from, from the caliphs or from the rulers, but also to collect hadith and to actually sponsor other people. And in some accounts even praise him for donating what amounts to 100,000 dirhams every year to the poor. So if anything, he's an exemplary figure uh, in this way. Ibn al-Mubarak began his quest for religious knowledge and righteousness at the age of 20, so we're told, until he died seeking uh, religious knowledge, conquests, trade, and spending money on less fortunate Muslims and pilgrimage. He's reported to have started his journey in the pursuit at the, uh, at, in the year 758, relentlessly recalling hadiths in Yemen, Egypt, Syria, uh, Mesopotamia, Basra al-Kufa. Uh, Ibn al-Mubarak transmitted hordes of authorities and is, uh, and is reported to have recorded between 20,000 and 25,000 prophetic tradition. In the sciences of hadith, Ibn al-Mubarak is not only considered a trustworthy transmitter, the technical, it's a technical category, thiqa, but his transmission is proof of authenticity uh, by scholarly consensus as well. So if Ibn al-Mubarak transmits a prophetic tradition, this tradition is considered authentic. And indeed, the authority of Ibn al-Mubarak's transmission is hardly ever questioned. Thus, we're told that the famed scholar and transmitter of hadith, Abdullah ibn Idris, reportedly rejected all traditions unknown to Ibn al-Mubarak. And moreover, the Abbasid Caliph, Harun al-Rashid, and of course, Ibn al-Mubarak's contemporary, acknowledges him as the ultimate authority on hadith legitimacy. In addition, various reports celebrate his strong memory and ability to memorize after only a single reading or hearing. One anecdote, for instance, has Ibn al-Mubarak, uh, Ibn al-Mubarak's father threatened to, to burn all his books, to which, of course, Ibn al-Mubarak responded that they are memorized by heart, so go ahead. Not surprisingly, one tradition has Ibn al-Mubarak enclosing himself in the company of the prophet and his companions Regurgita uh, regurgitating and meditating on prophetic traditions, on hadith in his home and weeping his described quote like a slaughtered bull, kathawr al-manhur, as he recites prophet prophetic traditions in Kitab al-Raqa'iq, which is a collection of hadith that renders one's heart tender. In addition to its spiritual implications, Ibn al-Mubarak uh, al -Mubarak emphasized the communal dimension of his collection of hadith. The ultimate usefulness of religious knowledge, he reportedly said, is to benefit one another. And thus he warns that the person who doesn't share hadith, who doesn't share his knowledge of 
the prophetic traditions, and even spend money and effort in its collection and spread will inevitably forego his knowledge, either by courting the ruler or by lying or dying. So perhaps the ultimate testimony to the importance of spreading hadith is the insistence on recording the various traditions. And of course, this is a pivotal shift from the earlier prohibition against penning down hadith. And this cannot be exaggerated. Not surprisingly, Ibn al-Mubarak provides numerous theological validations for this shift. After all, ink blots are characteristic of a true scholar's clothes, as Ibn al-Mubarak notes. The prophet himself, as Ibn al-Mubarak reports, singled out the pen as God's first creation, quote, which God ordered and so it wrote everything into being. The myriads of references to Ibn al-Mubarak's extensive travels, high ethic, studious recording of the various traditions only emphasize the importance of his hadith collections, which preserve and present the earlier record documenting the evolution of Muslim conceptions of core faith tenets, such as warfare, preserved in Kitab al-Jihad, and asceticism, and preserved in Kitab al-Zuhd. So the book on jihad or on holy war, and the book on asceticism, respectively. So the second aspect is jihad. So we looked at collecting, seeking knowledge, collecting prophetic tradition, and now we're looking at jihad and how saintliness also presents itself in this dimension. The salvific value of jihad and its centrality in the life of Ibn al-Mubarak and in that of other proto-Sunnis, so early Sunnis and proto-Sufis cannot, in general, it cannot be exaggerated. By the ninth century, the landscape of jihad has undergone, so by the time uh, or during Ibn al-Mubarak's career, the landscape of jihad had undergone dramatic changes since the death of the Prophet in the mid-seventh century. Here we see a shift from centrally directed state campaigns, which were the norm in the early Islamic empire, to independent, non-state sponsored campaigns manned by volunteer warriors for the faith on the frontier, particularly the frontier with the Byzantine empire. So we see a lot of volunteer warriors going to the, uh, to the certain parts on the frontier with the Byzantine empire and, and volunteering to fight. So this is, this is a kind of a, a characteristic of the shift from state sponsored to volunteer warriors. Uh, and along with other prominent proto-Sunnis, Ibn al-Mubarak was hailed as a champion, as a, as, a, as a champion really for these volunteer warriors of the faith. Curiously, while Ibn al-Mubarak spent the better part of his life, as we're told, on the Byzantine frontier, the biographical literature only refers sporadically to his conquest activities. You would think that if, if, if this is most of his career spent on the, on, the, uh, on the frontier, that most of what's remembered presents that, but actually not really. And this may be due to the preference of the biographers to focus on his scholarly and religious authority as transmitter of hadith and as an ascetic. And in the process, recording numerous traditions that Ibn al-Mubarak transmitted. At any rate, the scattered references in the biographical literature shed light on certain aspects of Ibn al-Mubarak's career as a warrior for the faith on the frontier, such as his endurance, even in harsh circumstances, relentless courage, and military skill and acumen. Perhaps one theme that cuts across these casual references to his uh, jihad is its intimate connection with hadith collection and ascetic practices. And indeed, there are various references to hadith being shared as well as recorded on the frontier. Thus, one report, uh, one narrative reportedly owes in the, uh, in the Mubarak's success in conquest to the presence of the Prophet and the companions with him. Again, this echoes the, the, you know, all these nights of prayer and remembering the different uh, prophetic traditions and reciting the different prophetic traditions. The theological message here, of course, is clear. The presence of the prophet and the companions with the pious is beneficial and is practically beneficial. So this is further elucidated in another report tradition attributed to uh, a contemporary of, uh, 
of Ibn al-Mubarak, Muhammad ibn al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad, according to which Ibn al-Mubarak appeared to him in his sleep and assured him that he was forgiven, not through hadith, but only through conquest. The connection between conquest and other ascetic practices is further corroborated by Ibn al-Mubarak's direct connection of both jihad and other ascetic practices such as fasting and night prayer. One, however, needs to turn to Kitab al-Jihad, so the collection, the, the collection of prophetic traditions that Ibn Mubarak collected himself for a deeper, on, on the topic of jihad or holy war, for a deeper look into the evolving Muslim conceptions of warfare and their manifestations at the time of Ibn Mubarak. One prophetic tradition, and I'm using Michael Cook's uh, trans uh, translation here, can be taken as a representative of all traditions in the book. The slain in jihad are three types of men, a believer who struggles with himself and his possessions in the path of God, such that when he meets the enemy in battle, he fights them until he, until he is killed. This martyr, Shaheed, is tested and is in the camp of God under his throne. The prophets do not exceed him in merit except by their level of prophecy, of course. Then a believer committing offenses and sins against himself who struggles with himself and his possessions. So struggle, of course, this is, you know, jihad, right? It's, it's struggle. Uh, the two dimensions, the personal and the other dimension in, in the battlefield. Who struggles with himself and his possessions in the path of God, such that when he meets the enemy in battle, he fights until he is killed. This cleansing wipes away his offenses and his sins. Behold, the sword wipes away sins, and he will be let into heaven from whatever gate he wishes. Then a hypocrite who struggles with himself and his possessions in the path of God, such that when he meets the enemy in battle, he fights until he is killed. This man is in hell since the sword doesn't wipe away hypocrisy. While the Hadith is primarily concerned with defining martyrdom, it also sheds light on the perceived salvific value of jihad. Uh, in addition to the striking uh, part, behold the sword wipes away sins, in the Saif Mahat al Khataya, uh, other traditions also attest to the redemptive work of the sword. The following prophetic tradition further unpacks this theme. Quote A man who loves or seeks martyrdom went out of his house, and God granted him with a stray arrow. With the first drop of his blood, God forgives all his committed sins, and with each drop, he elevates him one level until there are no more. The salvific efficacy of the sword is all the more clear in its direct connection with paradise. As two traditions establish, the gates of paradise fall under the shadows of swords. Those who die in battle in the path of God will not only enjoy the pleasures of the afterlife, but they will also don their swords before the throne of God. The sword is the very mark of salvation. Each warrior will thus testify with the sword before God's throne. Salvation is therefore no longer a communal endeavor associated with the caliph, and this is, again, this is an important theological shift, but it's an individual duty. And we'll see how later Sunnis and later Su uh, Sufis would internalize this in internal duty and develop a high ethos of, of the internal struggle or you know, the internal jihad. And in this light, Ibn al-Mubarak's jihad mission would be, should be understood. The third angle or the third aspect of his uh, presentation uh, or of his remembrance as, as, a, as a saint is asceticism. And Ibn al-Mubarak, as we saw, is one of the pioneer Muslim ascetics and his hadith collection, Kitab al-Zuhd, which he collected himself, is among the earliest on the subject. And it is thus no surprise that he earned the title, the pride of the warriors for the faith and the exemplar of ascetics, Imam al-Mujahideen wa Qudwat al-Zahideen. Similar to his jihad, I will discuss Ibn Mubarak's asceticism for the scattered, uh, from the scattered evidence in the biographical literature. And I will also use his own collection of hadith on the subject, Kitab al -Zuh. Murad, we'd want to leave some time for questions. Sure, so yeah, I, I'm almost there. Thank you. Um, while Ibn al-Mubarak's ascetic ethos shared some of the distinctive characteristics of other ascetics, such as night prayers and weepings, the centrality of the language of trade marks an important distinction. And this is 
This is a, a, a key distinction from other contemporary ascetics of his. On the one hand, his lucrative trade appears to have financed his conquests and travels, not only for him, but for many of his companions as well. And as I noted earlier, uh, Ibn al-Mubarak's sub uh, substantial inheritance and trade secured him a sizable capital that allowed him to finance his operations as well as regularly donate to the needy and poor. Several traditions thus have him sponsor fellow pilgrims and volunteer conquerors and generously redeem those imprisoned for failure to pay their debt. On the other hand, and most importantly, trade provides the working model for Ibn al-Mubarak's distinct asceticism. And to this end, one tradition cited by al-Qushari is quite informative. They were four in their time. One accepted nothing from his people or Sultan, the ruler. That is Yusuf in the Ghazbat, who inherited 70,000 dirhams from his father and from which he took nothing and worked in palm leaves with his hands. And the other accepted money and goods from his people as well as his ruler. And this is a Fazari who gave whatever he got from his people to the hospitalized and whatever he got from the Sultan, he gave to those who deserve it from the people uh, of Tarsus. And the, the third took from the people, but not from the Sultan. And this is Abdullah bin Mubarak. And of course, he's the superior one here who took from his people and rewarded them. And the fourth took from the Sultan and not from his people. And this is a cautionary tale. The tradition highlights two features of the Mubarak Zuhd and trade ethic, his resolute insistence on self-finances and independence from caliphal authority and resources, as well as rewarding his companions for their uh, donations. So to conclude, um, the reported history of Ibn Mubarak sheds light on the transition from, of course, caliphal to prophetic or private authority and its orthopratic uh, uh, or orthopraxic implications. And at the heart of the three discussed aspects of the proto-Sunni orthopraxy, so hadith collection, jihad, and zuhd, and asceticism, is the establishment of a religious community that is independent, for the most part, from the caliph. As caliphal authority was reduced to political stability, the religious scholars established their legitimacy as heirs to the prophets. And I want to conclude with a tradition from Ibn Asakir that aptly, I think, illustrates this shift. I saw Abdullah ibn Mubarak in my sleep, standing at the gate of paradise with a key in his hand. So I asked him, oh, Abu Abdurrahman, which is a pedonym, uh, given that his son is Abdurrahman, why are you standing here? He, and he said, this is the key of paradise that the prophet Muhammad gave me and said, so that I can visit with the Lord. Be my confidant in heaven as you are here. Uh, as you were on earth. It is now Ibn al-Mubarak and not the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, and this is, cannot be emphasized how important this is, who is the Prophet's own confidant holding the key to paradise. So this is, uh, this is an, uh, an exemplary case of a saint, and it's also an optimistic one in, 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 insofar as anyone can be such a saint, anyone can contribute to that. So thank you. Thank you very much, Murad. Um, some questions, and sorry, we took a while to get your PowerPoint up. You lost some time. I apologize for that. But perhaps people have some questions for Professor Takawi. And thank you all for bearing with me. I appreciate it. George Ike from Nigeria. OK, thank you, Prof. Uh, my question is this. Uh, we, we have the uh, Crusaders uh, in the Christian um, uh, world in those days who were fighting against uh, the infidels and then trying to make sure that Christianity um, uh, finds its ground in the society. And also we have these jihadists, as you said, who are also fighting on the, on the path of Islam. Uh, now, the jihadists are fighting the infidels to probably spread Islamic religion and, uh, and to continue to gain a wider spread of Islam. And now, in our modern time, we also have some uh, Islamic uh, adherents who believe that they are fighting on the side of Muhammad and uh, the world sees these people as terrorists. So, how can you differentiate between a jihadist 
who is fighting to spread uh, Islamic religion and uh, an Islamic terrorist who believes also that he is also fighting the same cause of propagating Islam and cleansing the world and the society of infidels. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'll, I'll start my answer by going back to this historical moment, right? So uh, at this particular historical moment, this was shared actually, it was up in the air, <laughs> so to speak between Christians and Muslims as well. So uh, we have a lot of, so, and this is of course not just my own insight, there's a lot of scholarship on this, on like you know, how patterns of violence in late antiquity uh, characterize different Christian and, and later of course Muslim community, and there are a lot of parallels. So I'll start with this, but also note that one important aspect is in the shift from state-sponsored, right, uh, jihad to the internalized or the focus on the internalized jihad. Like sometimes we overlook the historical trajectory of how this happened and looking at the life of this religious exemplar, so a saint basically, uh, gives us a, a, a glimpse of this historical development. What less to this? Uh, or one line of you know, factors that, led, that may have led to this. So I think in this way, it's, it's helpful. And of course, uh, there is a reason that the medieval biographers don't talk much about the jihad because they're interested more in other aspects, which, which I think so, like looking at how he used all this money and basically donated it to the poor and to help what he believed to be good causes such as sponsoring people, getting people out of jail, sponsoring people to go on pilgrimage, uh, education, etc. I think this is, this would be to me at least personally, uh, like an admirable like trade that's worthy of like evoking and talking about now. Uh, and again, I'm taking my cue here from the medievalists who talked less about the jihad. Like I had to like go and like look, you know, like different tr traditions. Like there was a lot of digging involved. There isn't, there, there was less digging involved when we're talking about all the things that he did for the poor, for instance, right? It's, it's, it's clearly stated. So I think I'm taking my cue in answering your question from, uh, from how the medievalists understood or remembered the story of uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Thank you, Professor Takawi. Other questions or comments? Yeah, Gabriel. Just very briefly, and also reflecting on um, George's question, thank you, Murad, for a great presentation. Um, I think it's different to be an exclusivist who sees the other as an infidel in the 21st century in a globalized world than it was in Abdullah ibn Mubarak's time. I just, I think we have just have to keep that in mind. Um, I mean, everyone was an exclusivist <laughs> almost at that time. And um, so uh, I just, I think that's important to keep in mind. And so I think when we look in the past, we don't have to only find saints among people who were pluralists, as we might like to be in the 21st century, we can still find saintliness and people who on certain questions such as exclusivism or militarism might have different perspectives. One last question before we bid farewell this afternoon or evening or early morning as the case may be for any of you. Well, I'd just like to thank our professors and presenters, Professor Reynolds and Professor Tabada and Professor Takawi. Thank you so much for a wonderful session and um, have a great weekend, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next Friday, same time, same station. All right, be well, everybody. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you.